Hi guys, Pastor Matt Chandler here. Pray uh, that this sermon, this resource, uh, be used by God in conjunction with you belonging to a local church uh, to grow you and sanctify you in your faith. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at TBC? You can do that either through the app or you can go online to TBC Resources uh, and give there. Again, pray that this blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. God called Abraham out of the chaos of the ancient world to make through him a chosen people to bless all nations. Then God delivered his people from Egypt, but they refused to enter into the land set aside for them and wandered in the desert. God gave them the law to consecrate them as his people, and eventually they entered the promised land, but they forgot his law and worshiped other gods. God called judges and prophets to warn and encourage them. He established David as king and there was peace and prosperity, but they forgot him again and the kingdom fell. So God sent Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. He sent Ezra to remind them of his law and the temple was rebuilt. Yet again, they turned from God and embraced the world around them. But God, longing for their whole hearts, called forth his prophet Malachi to remind them of his faithful love and of the kingdom that was coming. Good morning, Village Church. My name is Luke, and my family and I are your goers in Berlin, Germany. And it's great to be back with you this weekend. If, um, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing, what it would look like to get involved, I'll be in the lobby afterwards, and we'll, at 1.30 we'll be meeting in Suite 165, and we'd, we'd love for you to come by. This morning's text is Malachi 2, verses 10 through 16. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Luke. In every culture on earth, sociologists say there are these kind of borders and structures that are called plausibility structures. What, what, what those things are in regards, if we think about sociologically explaining humankind, it's like this seems right to us, this seems normal. Uh, it's a grid that you and I were given uh, by the time in which we were born, our parents, the culture we find ourselves in. And what, what a plausibility structure is, is just like this is how you make sense of the world. These are the rules. This is how humanity is going to flourish. And this is, this is how the world works. And this is how the world doesn't work. You tracking with me? That's a plausibility structure. And uh, every culture on earth has them, uh, some of them tied to reality and some of them not tied to reality. And, and I say all that today because if I, if I was given this text um, to preach in Africa, Asia, or India, I would feel little of the trepidation I feel today. But because of our plausibility structure, this sounds crazy. 
tyrannical. It, it sounds in a kind of way that I can feel it in the room, and I haven't even said anything yet. I mean, we just read it. That's all we did is read it. I'm like, oh, create. Like, you can feel it. Why? Because it, it's pressing on how we understand the world to work. Now, I said at the beginning, that doesn't mean that's tied to reality. It's just mean that that's kind of the age in which we live, that everything we just read seems a little crazy or sure, but, or no. And, and what I want to do is just kind of show you the beauty of this passage, but I know I'll be touching on some things uh, that are wounds and deep things, so just hang in there with me. I, I promise you this is good news, not bad news. On July 31st, 1999, uh, I stood in front of... Uh, all of my family, um, most of my friends, mentors, and, and Lauren, and I made some impossible promises. Like I said, I mean, I said this out loud. Uh, I said out loud on my wedding day, the most romantic day of my life. I said, if this goes bad, and like on the honeymoon, I think, oh my God, is this the rest of my life? And everything I think you are, you're not. I'm not going anywhere. And for the next seven years, both of us had to lean into that public promise before God and man. I did think, oh my God, what have I done on my honeymoon? I did continually for the next seven years. And I'm saying seven years, and, and I know some of you have been in this a lot longer than seven. I, I'm not saying we seven and we did some things right and then things got fixed. That, that's not, I'm not trying to flex on that. I'm trying to say for seven years, Bad communication, no money, bad sex, cold at home. Oh, I can't say bad. You want me to soften it? Like, it was just bad. There wasn't an area of our marriage that I go, yeah, yeah, that right there. On top of that, I was a flipping king at work. Everybody else loved me. Everything else worked except this woman. And if she would just get right. I said this in the nine, too, if you're nervous. She was sitting right here. And, but listen, this, what I'm saying wasn't a surprise to her. Like she's not laying in bed next to me thinking all of her girl, her dreams had come true. She felt stuck. We felt trapped. It felt like a cycle we couldn't get out of. We had no idea of the origin of it in our life. And it was just awful. And then on top of that, I, I stood in, in front of everybody. Like, why, first of all, why are we even talking about that on our wedding day? Well, why are we even going to say, hey, this could go bad? Like, it's the most wrong. Shouldn't this all be just like butterflies and rainbows? Like, shouldn't this whole thing be like for the rest of our romantic, blissful lives? But that, no, we said, hey, this could go bad. And when it does, and if it does, I'm here. And then we said this. Like, like we, we both said in front of everybody, like, if, if you're in some sort of horrific accident, like, the beauty that drew me to you vanishes. Your face gets all maligned and mangled. She, the beauty thing's one way. It's not. And, and let's just say I have to like wipe your tail and I've got to tuck you in and, and there's no more sex ever. And there's, then I'm not going anywhere and I'll wipe your tail and I'll remain chaste and I will for the rest of my life and bank on future glory. Like we said that, better or worse, sickness and health in front of everyone. And the Lord tested both of those. For Lauren, it was learning that I had a brain tumor. I'd probably be dead in two or three years. It was close to a year of me having a flat effect and not being my kind of normal, playful self. And she leaned into the covenant. And, and for seven years, we just couldn't. There was all sorts of family baggage. I was being, I was such a jackass. Like, I, I mean, I just... I thought Lauren would quench some things in me. It was unfair to expect of her to. She couldn't heal the wounds in my soul, but I thought she was going to. She couldn't validate me enough. It was, it was like a black hole of validation. I would just suck it all in and feel like nobody had done anything. And, and that was what I was bringing to bear. I don't share what she was bringing to bear. That's her story, but she brought some stuff. But I, I, had, a, I had like crates and she had like a carry-on. <laughs> and and that was, that's the stuff that we had to work through. And again, I, I say ours was seven. I know some of you in this room, you're still in it. It's been 20. And so, but, but it's, the, it's the covenant that we had to lean into. Now, um, this passage at a really high level, and then we'll get down into specifics, but at a real high level is saying there's 
two ways to live. There's two ways to order your universe. There's two ways in in which you can uh, manage and create your life. And and here's the two. There's covenantal order and there's self-indulgence. Those are your two ways of order. In fact, here's what I'll say. I love you. You walked in here today and one thing or another has governed the decisions you've made and the life that you're living in right now. It is covenantal order or it's self-indulgence. One of those two are how you're living. And let me give you some definitions. Covenantal order. All relationships are made peaceful and pure by the fulfillment of covenants and promises and oaths and contracts and commitments. Children to parents and parents to children, husbands to wives and wives to husband, employer to employee and employee to employer. Citizen to state and state to citizen. The peace, prosperity, and joy, the shalom is the biblical word, of community is held together by the deep, strong spirit of covenant keeping that pervades the community. The very fabric of the community is the trustworthiness of its people. Do they keep their commitments? That's one way to live. We're men and women of our word. We said it, we're going to do it. We promised it, we're gonna follow through on it, right? That's covenant keeping. And that creates a certain kind of environment. And then there's self-indulgence. The other way for people to try to live together in community is the opposite of covenantal order. It's what you might call the disorder of self-indulgence. In this community, the spirit of commitment making and commitment keeping has been replaced by a spirit of emotional and physical impulse. Therefore, the moral fabric of faithfulness to covenants and promises and contracts is unraveled, and what's left are the individual strands of private gratification. That's where we are. Our entire society right now is built around and predicated upon self-indulgence. We are people who give in to our own appetites, damned be the consequences. I gots to get mine is the banner over humanity in our day and age. And the Bible's going to make the argument, and it's going to lean on it heavy today, that the more you live your life by your stomach, the more things unravel regarding what you actually long for and want. And so the picture is being painted here in Malachi, the very end of the Old Testament, the prophetic end. When we're done with this book in just a few weeks, it's the last thing God says to a people for 500 years until John the Baptist shows up in the gospel of Matthew and he leans into them that there's two ways to do this and the reason why there's tears all over my altar and you're like, where are you, God? And why aren't you answering? I And why? Is because you have chosen your stomach and your emotional impulses and you have betrayed the covenant that I made with you so that for you and I today the weight of it I'm keeping it weighty I'm making a lot of jokes today is that so much I got I love you so much of the pain in your life is because you keep giving into your impulses and you have such a tiny little view of what it means to be human you have no understanding of forever It's just now and me and I get to get what I want and anything outside of that is tyrannical and it's going to steal from you life and life to the full despite the fact that all the data says we're in pain and anxious and we hate our lives and the sheer volume of suicidal ideation in the lives of our kids whether it be active or passive is overwhelming right now. This is the world we've handed to them. Create your own realities. Decide what's good for you. Do what you want. Do what feels good. Bad, 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 bad in every direction. And the Bible says that's how humanity spirals into degradation and death. And regardless of where you, whether you're a Christian or not, nobody in this room's looking up at culture right now going, actually, I think we're heading in the right direction. Like nobody, isn't that, like that's wild. Like the right and left, we can't agree on anything, but we agree on that. Like right and left, we're getting political idea. You're looking out and you're like, this is terrible. We got to fix it. Double down on self-indulgence on both sides. Yeah, it's wild. So he, here's, the, here's my outline, and it's quick. Covenant made, covenant's broken. That's my outline, two points. So let's look back at the first verse, verse 10. Have we not all one Father, and has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless 
to one another, profaning the covenant of our father. So again, you and I in 2023, not really dialed into the Old Testament for the most part. This might be lost on us, but he's referencing two things in particular. He's referencing the Abrahamic covenant, and this is where God, the world's lost its mind. I mean, just a kind of evil and darkness, like a kind of a spiraling into wickedness that would be hard for us, even in 23, to get our minds around. And God finds Abraham and he calls Abraham to himself. And you remember week one when we said, uh, the, the Lord declared, I have loved you, declares the Lord. Abraham didn't do anything. God just called him. He didn't give him the law and he obeyed the law. And so there, he's my guy because this guy, no, no, no. He just loved him. He just snatched him as one of the guys out from the, you know, however many were on earth at that time. And he said, through you, this is the Abrahamic covenant. You can read about it in Genesis 12. Through you, I'm going to bless all the families on the earth. Through your line, I'm going to make a people out of you. They're going to outnumber the stars in the sky, outnumber the sands on the beach. And through this people, I'm going to bless all the people on earth. And then the Abrahamic covenant moves into the Mosaic covenant. And even if you don't have a church background, you, you kind of know the Mosaic covenant. This is the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. So God delivers his people out of slavery, and then he gives them the law, right? This is the Mosaic covenant. You obey this for human flourishing. And the Levitical law, eventually we'll preach the Leviticus. That'll be a blast. And um, it, it, is both, it is both vertical and horizontal in its unpacking of God's design. So God says, I am holy. This is how you will relate to me. And because you are my people, this is how you will relate to one another. And in your relationships with one another, governed by my moral law, you will, relate, you will show to the world the beauty of my order and design. You'll do things like I designed it, and the world will see that it's beautiful, and they'll be drawn unto my name. And you will be used to bring order and light to darkness, whether they believe in me ultimately or not. That's the Mosaic Covenant. And Jesus fulfills the Mosaic Covenant, but he doesn't remove the moral law on your life and mine. The moral law still exists that you and I might behaviorally become more and more and more like the people of God. So we positionally are given righteousness at salvation. But then in that position, we are called to holiness and called to covenant keeping according to the moral law of God. These are the covenants that are being referenced here. And maybe you're like, like I mean, I don't, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm not a Jew, Chandler. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's the next part in my notes. And so Romans 11 says that if you are a Christian, you have been grafted in to these covenants. So that if you are a believer in Christ and you have been baptized in the name of Jesus, that you have been grafted in, that the Mosaic of the Abrahamic covenant, they're not other than you. Actually, they were promises made to another people, but in God's love for you, he's grafted you into the promises. He's grafted you into the covenants. Peter would say it like this. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so the, the, this hard chapter for us, starts with, hey, you're under the covenant that I made with you, a, a, a plan to prosper you, to make you beautiful, to give you life and life to the full. And then he goes to say, and here's where you have been faithless. I have not been faithless. You have been faithless. And he says, he uses the same word faithless in the Hebrew three times to discuss the three areas in which his people had, had had lived treacherously concerning his covenant. The first one was how they interacted with one another as the people of God. The second was in marrying unbelievers. And then the third one was in divorcing their spouses. And so I won't be able to say all that I need to say about any one of those three. Each one of those could be an eight-week series by itself. So I'm going to air war it, and then I'm going to point you to a place where there's more answers. We good? Okay. I, I, even if you said no, this is where we were going. So let, let's start in verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our Father? So here, here's how he starts. Hey, are, don't we all have the same Father? So, so this is specifically now two people who are Christians or pe the people of God. Like, don't we have one Father? It isn't what you and I hold most in common, not our own earthly family of origin, not our own backstory, but is not what you and I have most in common. If we're Christians, that God is our father, if that's true and God is my father and, and God is your father, then that 
puts me at a level with you in regards to grace, mercy, respect, and, and patience that, that's otherworldly because we have been shown that same grace, mercy, and patience by our heavenly Father so that we become people that give the benefit of the doubt and, and extend grace. Why? Because don't we have the same Father in your story just like mine? Weren't you outside the promises and got pulled in by this father? Don't you have the same experience I does where God moves towards us when we fail and stumble? Isn't that what we have most in common? And don't I have more in common with you as my brother and sister in Christ as I do with maybe even a family member of mine who doesn't love him, who has rejected his gospel? Aren't you more family to me than them? Who you are? And so the law is given to govern our relationships with one another. And as the New Testament begins to be written, the, the, the way that the New Testament writers talk about our lives together really falls into close to 60 commands that are just known as the one another's. And, and you, can, you can break them down into three categories. A third of the one another's in the New Testament are around unity. And, and I'll just read some of these. Be at peace with one another. Don't grumble among one another. Be of the same mind with one another. Accept one another. Don't bite, devour, or consume one another. Don't boastfully challenge or envy one another. Gently and patiently tolerate one another. Just sidebar on that. I like the honesty of the Bible. I always have. This just said, for some of us, it's just going to be a respectful tolerance. You all right? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, it's not all of us going to be like, gosh, I can't wait to spend all my waking hours with you. Yeah, I think what's happening in this passage is like, I'm going to bother some of you. You're going to bother me. It's fine. We, we bother. So we just, we gracefully and gently tolerate one another. It's a brother of Christ. And I love that guy. You guys want to hang out? No, no, but I love him. <laughs> Bless his name. I want every good thing for him from a distance. And then be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Bear with and forgive one another. Seek good for one another and don't repay evil for evil. Don't complain against one another. Confess sins to one another. So that's a unity block. The second third is all about loving one another. In fact, there are 10 direct commands that we would love one another. But then on top of that, it says through love, serve one another. Again, tolerate one another in love. Greet one another with a kiss of love and be devoted to one another in love. Do you hear the laws governing our relationship with each other? So you have a third that's um, unity, a third that's love, and then about 15% that, that I would put in the category unity and, or humility. And here's some of those. Give preference to one another in honor. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Serve one another. Wash one another's feet. Don't be haughty. Be of the same mind. Be subject to one another. Clothe yourselves in humility towards one another. Gosh, even that is so countercultural, even inside the church, that we would look culty if we actually lived this out. I mean, wouldn't we? Like where, even in like modern evangelicalism, is this the framework by which we choose churches and we choose communities? No, no, no. We come in and we're like, I, this is the kind of music I like, and these kind of programs I expect, and I better get, and, and we've got this. It's not, do they preach the book? Are they fearless about the gospel? Are they trustworthy? Will they press me into holiness? No, it's like, how's the coffee in the lobby? <laughs> Parking lot's a nightmare. And it is. We're going to fix it. And um, like, you, you've got this, what is, what's happening? What's, your stomach, it's self-indulgence that's driving it. It's not who's serious about my soul, it's who tickles my ear. It's not who let the book be weighty, but who will entertain me so I might leave feeling better about myself. Let me pick that place. And, and I'm saying this, and, and before God, it, it, man, if we become your church home, praise God. And if we don't, praise God. I mean, there's a lot of good, healthy churches. I'm saying self-indulgence marks us more than covenant, even in how we pick our churches even in how we pick our churches. And, and by the way, this, this idea of one anothering is why we organize even our discipleship pathways like we do. Do you know the only place, the only environment we have that's just pure didactic teaching, like one guy up here for 40 minutes, is here? In every other environment, you're gonna be at round tables with a group of people hearing, discussing, and applying the word of God. And let, so let me just say this as we're kicking into the fall. I wanna encourage you again. Find a group, join it, 
And then from that group, find places to connect, go to a class together, go to the art of care, you can do the training, but just find a place to go and learn and grow in a knowledge of the Lord together as we one another one another in a way that makes the world go, that's different, that that's different, that our base posture would be deference to the other. That, that again, here's what's crazy. Just that kind of loving one another, serving one another, caring for one another would make us look culty in 2023. Are you a part of that weird cult? No, it's, it's, it's Baptist, actually. <laughs> Which, spoiler alert. Now, from there, he moves on. He moves on, and we get the same word again, the same Hebrew word that was above it. Now comes out, except now it's in verse 11. And here's what it says. Judah has been faithless, and abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. Now, I want to stop, and, and here's what I, I want to highlight this, because it, it's, it's been used stupidly, in, in a stupid way. Um, remember in, I think, week one or week two, when I talked about proof texting, where you go to the Bible and you just pull a verse out of its context and you slap it on a coffee cup, and who cares if that's what it means or that's what it says? You're just going to make it say that? Remember when we talked about proof texting? Okay, another thing that happens all over, TikTok and Instagram right now, is taking kind of modern ideologies and trying to read them back onto the text, right? And this is a verse, this passage back in the 50s and 60s were used by a series of jackasses who didn't fear God and didn't understand the Bible. And what they did is they pointed to race and said that the races shouldn't intermingle and blacks better not marry whites and whites better not marry blacks. And you better stick to your own because this is what the Bible says. And those men neither feared God nor knew the Bible. So this passage, marriage outside the covenant community, is specifically forbidden among the Canaanites. It was forbidden by Moses, but not for reasons of racial or ethnic exclusion. He said the why in Deuteronomy 7. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. For they would turn away your sons from following me or to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you and he would destroy you quickly. Listen, this isn't about race and ethnicity. The Canaanites worshiped gods that required child sacrifice. They, they worshiped gods that required sexual perversion in the temple. And he's saying, don't marry into that because the force of two gods in the house on the children creates violence and they will turn from me. I care about stability and community for human flourishing. And if you marry into that, you'll destroy the next generation. And think about, let's just stop it. I mean, think about it. If we're saying that the creator God of the universe has saved us through his son and that's the only means of salvation and that he wants all of our life for all of our life, why and how in the world will we marry someone that would be like, well, I mean, not really. I mean, maybe. And, and he goes so far as like, how can you go and worship Moloch and, and then show up at my temple like I'm taking your gift? That's not the way this is going to work. And think about it. Like, I'm, I'm just, marriage is hard enough. I mean, marriage is hard enough. Like, and I, I deeply, my wife deeply loves the Lord, and marriage can be difficult. And, and I want you to, let me say specifically this. For some of us, Man, we didn't know. I mean, they, they went to church. They looked, oh my gosh, yeah, they, I think they love the Lord. And we got married, and then there was this surprise on the back end of it. We're not really. And, and we've been stuck there for a long time, and that's it's really painful. And I wish I could sit you down with some of our singles who would trade loneliness now for a more horrific kind of loneliness later. The weight of this passage is that Flourishing occurs when there's unity around the worship of the creator, God of the universe, who is our father. And what God is after in that is godly offspring, but a lineage of faith. And so if you're single, well, let me do this. One, one of the things I, I do almost every week is if I, I finish my notes, I turn in my notes, and then I find someone who I like uh, that preached this passage before and I listen to it, right? 
And um, I, I listened to Piper's this week, and, and he said that there were a couple of things he wanted to say about this passage that this passage is not saying. And so I'm just going to steal his stuff right now and give it to you, right? Here's what this passage is not saying, right? It's not saying that it's impossible in every case for an unbelieving spouse to be converted. And yeah, we know that's true. We've seen that happen quite a bit here. An unbelieving spouse becomes a believer. We actually see in the Bible that we're actually meant to live in such a way that an unbelieving spouse would hear and, and come to know the Lord. We are to live in such a way that they're convicted and they come to know the, the Lord. And then the second thing that's not in this text is he's not saying that if you're married to an unbeliever, you should give out. Actually, the Corinthians are trying to make that argument 500 years later, and Paul explicitly condemns that thinking and says, no, you don't just get out because. The Bible is putting this weight specifically on you singles. If you still have a choice, choose the one that loves and fears the Lord. Not just a good church guy. Not just like a moral Republican. Not, no, marry someone who loves and fears the Lord, lest you trade a season of loneliness for a lifetime of loneliness. It's, it's a hard text. But in so doing, the Lord is trying to lead you into love and beauty, depth and beauty, and to keep you from a life that begins to spiral out of control. Now, um, the last one, and the one that probably um, presses the most against our plausibility structure is the last 14 through 16, and here's what it says. But you say, why does he not? Why doesn't the Lord answer me? Why is my life so hard? What's going on here? Why is, but you say, why does he not? Why does he not accept my offering? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. So Lots here, so let's, let's chat. Um, the, the first thing going on in this passage that I wanna highlight is that throughout the scriptures, the Bible uses marriage as the primary illustration of God's relationship with his people, especially in covenant keeping. You see it in Hosea, you see it in Isaiah, you see it in Jeremiah, you see it throughout the Bible, you see it in the New Testament in Jesus' teaching about the wedding supper of the Lamb, you see it in the teaching of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, where he says, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church, and that he gave himself up for her, washing her in the water of the world, that he might present her as holy and blameless and spotless in his sight. And then he tells the women, women, hate Honor your husband. Submit to your husband like the church does to Christ. And so when you, when men in particular, and, and let me, again, another thing. I, I need 70 minutes for the sermon. I'm not going to have it. This passage exists in the Bible to protect women from stupid men. This is not some sort of patriarchal, that this is God saying to men, that's my little girl, and you better be careful. I'll cut your whole lineage out from the tent of Jacob. This is not, this is, and, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm not one of the guys that have bought the lie that women don't sin anymore and all their sin is because of men. I'm not on that train. I think that's actually doing quite a bit of damage. But, but I am telling you right now, this is God saying to men to protect women from stupid men, you better not do that to my little girl. All right, I knew it would get heavy when I said that, but here's the picture. The picture is, when, when I sit, entered into this covenant with Lauren, we just said, like Christ in the church, I, I'm going to be Christ in this relationship. I'm going to love you. I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to choose to love you. I'm going to chase after your heart. I'm going to move towards you, even when, when maybe it's not. There's no reciprocity in it right now. And Lauren's covenant was, I'm going to honor and respect you as best I can by the grace of God for as long as I can, that we might show to the world the beauty of covenant and so that our kids have the best possible shot at knowing, seeing, and thinking Jesus is beautiful. Okay, listen, I'm 
20 years I've, I've been at this church. And the number of times some 27-year-old has gotten in those waters, some 33-year-old has gotten in those waters and said this, grew up in a Christian home, went to church on the weekends, I remember laughing a lot, I remember that, and, and then my parents divorced. And, and when they divorced, and then now you get the story, right? E- even though they were told by their folks, even though it had nothing to do with them, they internalized it as that something's wrong with me and what was stable becomes unstable. What was known becomes unknown. What was, what was solid becomes quicksand. A couple of things. The Bible gives provision for divorce. If one of the spouses commits adultery, no repentance, no, that, that's get a divorce. If you've been abandoned, the Bible says you, you can get a divorce. And, and I would say that the Bible's going to say, if you're being abused, don't feel the weight of this passage. If you got a divorce because of abuse, I don't want you to feel the weight of this passage, nor do I want you to feel or carry any shame of the decisions that your kids have made that might have come from that divorce. But the covenant says, and all the sociological data in the world says, where a man and woman are covenanted together in love. Kids tend to do really well. And where things are unstable and fractured and broken, they tend to struggle. And so I might be the lone voice in the wilderness saying, stay together for your freaking kids and keep working at it. I'm not saying to do that if you're being abused. I'm telling you to get out and we'll help you. I'm, I'm not telling you to do that if you're being emotionally tormented. But asterisk. If he's just not as romantic as you would like, that's not abuse. That's not emotional. If he's not as funny or outgoing as you would like, that's not abuse, dadgummit. If you just wish it would be different, that's not abuse. Let's not create categories to let our self-indulgent compulsions let, like, grab what we want. I'm sorry that he's not as romantic as you would like. He's probably not having as much sex as he would like, but I'm hoping he ain't bailing on you for that. This is the covenant that binds us together. And then on top of that, the the passage says this. God was a witness. Do you see it in the text that God was a witness? That we made this promise. Like I stood in front of God. Yeah, her parents were there and my parents were there. but, But the vow I made was between me, God, and Lauren with our community as witnesses. And here's what I said to God concerning his little girl. For better or worse. Rich or poor, sickness and health, by the grace of God, I'll love her as best I can. I won't quit on her. I'll cling to her. I'll say no to a thousand other things to pursue her heart until the day I die. And the Bible here and in many other places, God says, hey, I remember you saying that. I remember you saying that. And brothers, let me... There needs to be a holy fear in your heart concerning your treatment of God's daughters. I just don't know if you've ever thought about that. If you have a daughter, you've thought about it because you've thought, kill them. <laughs> but then you, but here's the, here's the crazy of self-indulgence. But then you don't mind for your own comfort or your own lust or your own brokenness to treat the Lord's daughter in, in a way that if anyone ever, ever, treated your daughter, we'd have a prison ministry here to come visit you. (laughs) Right? I mean, this is just the truth. Like, God was like, I heard you say it. I'm holding you to it. And then on top of that, he he says that, that, like, his spirit, like, he put his, like, big S spirit, not just in the individuals as being his children, but, like, on the marriage. Like, he puts this S, big S spirit on the marriage. Look at it. Verse 15. Did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. This is Richard Taylor's breakdown of this passage. I'm just going to read it word for word. Here, here's how he, he wrote this out in his own language. Don't you know that God made you one with your wives? 
And in spite of your treachery in divorcing your wives, there is still a remnant of that spiritual bond. And what was the purpose of that oneness? It is to produce godly offspring with God's help. Legacy, community, order, covenant keeping. And when we divorce, we break the covenant that was meant to reveal the big C covenant that God has made, which is why even the certificate of divorce, according to the New Testament, was given because of the hardness of heart, not because it's what God wants or what God's okay with. Literally, it's like, because you're so fragile and weak, I'll give you this, but it's not my heart. My heart is covenant keeping. And so let me, let me, I know, I told you, I wasn't gonna, you, you can't, again, this alone could be five, six weeks long series. Maybe we need to do that, but marriage can be far more complex than I've been able to paint it in the last 12 minutes or however long I've been ranting on this. So because I can't go, yeah, I know there's probably a thousand questions now, because I can't answer all of those, I can kind of send you to a place where I think there'll be some answers for you. And so I, I would just say, man, if your marriage is on fire right now, if um, things are broken, they feel like beyond repair, you just don't know how much gas is left in the tank, I'd point you in a couple of directions. One, uh, as always, recovery on Wednesday night is a good place to go and, and just be completely honest. And then a second place is we actually, as part of our classes this fall, we have a re-engage class that's just about, okay, how do we, we, we woke up, gosh, this is not what either of us want, this is on fire, uh, I don't know how we're gonna make it, so how do, we, how do we re-engage with one another and how do we keep our covenant to each other and to the Lord? And so both of those are options. In fact, we got a care table set up in the foyer. And then one, one more, more thing and then I'm gonna preach my conclusion. Brothers, and, and listen, I, I'm, not trying to be, I'm not trying to be overly harsh on you, but I do wanna press you a little bit. If your wife, wife of your youth, as the Bible says it, has come to you and said, I think we need to get some help, and your posture has been, nah, maybe you do, you have showed your tail. That the wife of your youth would come to you and say, we're off. I don't feel connected to you. We're not functioning like I, we, you, I think we both want us to function. We're missing each other, and I don't, I don't know how to make sense of it. We've been trying to work it out. We're not able to work it out. I think we need to get some help. And, and your response is nah. Like certainly, I hope even in this moment, like you can see the hardness of your own heart. This is that girl you, you saw at school or across the bar, and you were like, dang. Squirted on some cologne, walked over there like, what's up, girl? And, and you tried to woo her. And, and maybe you had ulterior motives. You, you tried to seduce you like you went after it. Like you had a plan and you put forth effort and you wooed her heart. And now after all of these years, that woman is saying, something's not right. Brothers, it is a wicked, harsh thing for you to form the posture of, man, that sounds like a, like a you issue. No, there, it's one flesh. There is no her issue. There's y'all issue. And really, there's never any healing without two sets of humble hearts. What, last thing, and then I keep saying that. <laughs> Ladies, I'm not just bashing the fellas. I, let make, let's make some eye contact because I love you. You are a trash Holy Spirit. Which means, as I've been saying all this, if you've like squeezed your husband's leg, or when you get in the car, you're like, what'd you think about that? Um, you, listen, again, I'm not trying to, look at me. You will harden his heart towards the work of God in his life. You, you let God use me to be the heavy, and you pray and lay him before the Lord, and you pray and you lay him before the Lord, and, and you respect him as best you can, and you love him as best you can. You keep bringing him before the Lord. You keep dreaming for your family that he'd be the man that you want him to be, but you don't nag him into the kingdom. You don't nag him into repentance. Like, I love you. You're just, you're just a terrible, terrible, terrible Holy Spirit. And some of you think you got the gift of it. And the Bible, the like Bible says crazy things for guys who live with women like that. Like, you know, the Bible says it's better to like die in the desert. I didn't make that up. Like the Bible's like better that you should, dying in the desert sounds nasty. It's like, go on, bro. I'm sorry. You know, or living on the roof. So don't, net, lady, nobody's getting nagged into the kingdom. But I promise you, you can pray them in. I promise you, you can pray them in. 
I don't know, some of you are like, man, brother, whatever, I've been praying for 20 years. Great, pray for 21. Pray for 22. Pray for 23. Hold fast the covenant of grace. Now, Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Listen, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I love those two verses together and not one plucked out above the other. Why can you feel free in this moment, regardless of your present struggle, regardless of your back? Man, you might have a couple of nasty divorces and some kids that are wild and you got all the shame and stuff going on and the book here says, no, you have an empathetic high priest. That Jesus on his throne isn't like, you make me sick, but he's moved towards you in his grace. And so he says, let us draw near with confidence to this throne of grace. Now, what does covenant keeping look like? Well, for the Christian, covenant keeping begins with our relationship with God and then flows out to our relationship with one another. It does not save us. It's that in our salvation, we begin to keep the covenant. So maybe this, this is the illustration that will help. Um, on July 31st, 1999, Lauren and I said our vows and we became married. 24 years later, I am not more married to her now than I was then. 40 years from now, I won't be more married to her then as I am now. We're married. And yet what happened after the exchanging of vows, covenant vows, is both of our behaviors modified almost immediately. Before God, I, I have not been on another date with another woman since that time, except my daughters. I had handed out my number to another lady. I, I have thrown no game anywhere. I have not given my number to a woman at the gym. I have not, right? Or if you're younger, snap. I didn't give him my snap. I don't even know what that means, but I think that's the way it happens now. And um, yeah, no, what happened? My behavior started to align with the covenant. I'm married, therefore, there's a series of behaviors that begins to mature and continues to mature all the days of our life. So there, there's a way that Lauren receives love. I needed to learn that, and then I needed to kind of figure out how to go after her heart in the unique way that God wired her. That there's things that Lauren likes and doesn't like, and I want to learn that, and I want to move towards her in covenant love. And that's been growing and maturing because she's been maybe 15 different women in the 24 years we've been married. And I, you're giggling, but that's the reality of it. And so it's not oh, I need to do these things so that I might be married. It's that I'm married, therefore, let my behavior be conformed to the covenant. Not let my behavior be conformed to my self-indulgence, what she's not doing and what she should be doing. No, that's self-indulgent. It's the covenant. I made these vows. I'm living into these vows. So Christian, before God, I'm not just talking about your marriage. Like, what respectable sins are you tolerating in your life like God doesn't see them? Hmm? What's your wallet say you really love? How much of your life is driven by emotional impulse rather than covenant-keeping delight? Now, if you're an unbeliever, if you're not a Christian in here, um, the invitation for you, friend, is covenant order and beauty. I, I, I preach this, I mean, I, I think I had an hour-long sermon a couple of months ago on the next generation. Just my heart's so provoked for them. We have really screwed them. We have put a more, like you decide the moral universe, you decide what's right or wrong, you decide, and the sheer volume of suicidal ideation, whether passive or active in this current generation, has shot through the roof. What God promises is shalom, order. He says this, you, you don't have to know and you don't have to be in control because I am. 
And so the good news of the gospel is that we would bring our lives into alignment, seek his forgiveness for being our own God, repent of that, and come under his authority and live our lives out of the beauty of covenant, having our lives ordered more and more and more by his covenant, by his law, both to him and us and to one another in a way that that becomes beautiful and, and attractive to a world that's descending into chaos or we can just look like the rest of the world. So if you're not a believer, the invitation is, hey, hey, say yes to Jesus. Repent of living by your stomach. Come to him and receive mercy and grace in your time of need. And so those are kind of covenant opportunities we have before us right now. I would just encourage you to walk in them. I was having a conversation with a young woman in the lobby right before we came in here, and there's a I've said for 20 years, like, church is a really dumb hobby. Because right now, if you're feeling conviction, that invitation from God for more, and you don't do anything with that, you harden your heart against the living God. You say, no, thank you, I'm good, and you choose the descent of self-indulgence. And then if you're not careful, before long, you'll blame him for it. But I'm here just to invite you in again, Christian, to remember the covenant, the vows that you made before God. You gave him your whole life and your whole heart. Where have you kind of started snatching some things back? Unbeliever, the, the invitation doesn't, doesn't matter how you've come in, what your background is, what your pre- pre- present struggle is. The invitation is grace and mercy. I have loved you, declares the Lord. What would it look like for you to say yes to him? I want you to do me a favor. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm just going to pray over you. Father, I thank you for these men and women. Gosh, I thank you for the weight in the room today. I pray that you would teach us to fear your name. Pray that we would be men and women that keep our word that keep the promises, that lean into the covenant, that live in such a way to reveal that there is a king over our lives that's not just our emotional impulses. Forgive us in our foolishness. Forgive us where we have broken covenant, where we have not been men and women of your word. I thank you that there's grace for us, regardless of how awful that's been or what kind of carnage was created through it. Thank you that in time you heal all things, and so we lay those broken things at your feet. Pray especially for those who just feel so stuck. They felt stuck for such a long time under the shame of the enemy that likes to kind of blame them and have them in their head about how they, if they just did this or just did that. I pray freedom for them this morning. I just pray a, a humility to come before you and lay their spouses, their kids before you and, and ask you to work and then to trust that in time, trust that in time, their prayers will be answered. I thank you even as we transition to looking at the cross through the Lord's Supper be blown away by your grace, your covenant keeping that went to the cross to fulfill all that we could not fulfill in the covenant. So we end today celebrating new life in you, grace that will never run out, and mercy that's new every morning. That's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen.